Good evening. We're on the air again with another edition of Patience on the News. I think it's 16 years. Every time we have this program, I add a year, but I think it's 16 years that uh, we've been doing it. We've had a lot of people on. Tonight, we're very, very pleased to have the governor of Maine, Janet Mills, as our guest. Uh, Janet, welcome. Thank you, Harold. It's good to be here. So, you know, I was thinking about this today when I was walking to the studio. I think you are the 75th governor of Maine. I think I am. And there was something that the other 74 in a row had in common. Hmm. Well, I'm the first governor from Franklin County. <laughs> you are the first governor I from am Franklin the first County. From Franklin County, yes. I want the people. Yeah. I hope we ship this program up to Farmington. I hope let, so. And let people know she's the first. They probably know it. And uh, the first woman governor. It took us 75 tries to get a woman as governor. 200 years, 180, 198 years, yeah, to be exact. Yes. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, to 2018, 198 mm -hmm. years. So you're not the first Mills from Franklin County, and I guess there was one in Hancock County. Oh, yes. Uh, you're not the first member of your family to be in politics, is that right? Correct. Um, my brother Peter was in the Senate. He was a practicing trial lawyer in Western Maine for many years and still owns a practice there. And um, a well-known Republican, well -known right? Well-known Republican, yes. In fact, he ran for governor in a primary or two uh, as a Republican. And he was a Republican state senator for many years. Uh, we practiced law together and uh, in Skowhegan, Maine. And during that time, I also ran for the House of Representatives. So at one point, we were both in the House. And then other times I was in the House, he was in the Senate, and we were practicing law and earning a living. So it was kind of interesting. Well, your father would like that because he was a pretty well-known politician himself. He was a Republican uh, state senator. Another Republican. Definitely. Um, I, I grew up in a family of Republicans. And we uh, grew up in Farmington, uh, just down the road from Margaret Chase Smith in Skowhegan. My other grandfather, my father's father, was a Republican state senator and state legislator from uh, Stonington, actually, years ago. I mean, a hundred plus years ago. But then my grandmother brought, them, brought him back to Farmington, uh, where he uh, worked. My parents both, uh, my mother was an English teacher for 30-something, 30 37 years or so. And we lived in a small house in Farmington where the five of us grew up. We worked uh, at a very early age. We all had paper routes. I was like five or six years old when I was delivering papers. Uh, up and down the main street of Farmington. And, um, but Margaret Chase Smith was a frequent visitor. Fred Payne, former governor from 1949 to 1953. These were all very prominent Republicans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You didn't have too many Democrats visiting your house growing up. None. Probably <laughs> zero. What about Severin Beliveau? Did he ever visit? I <laughs> uh, don't think so. I didn't know Severin until I met Cynthia. Yeah. The better half I got to know first. So, uh, you, you, you have this long line of re Republican politicians in your family, but you have a sister who's a Democrat, right? She is. I was the first. I was the, I was the white sheep of the family. The white the first sheep. First to become uh, enrolled as a as a Democrat. Yeah. First one. Yes. Others followed suit later on. Was your father alive when you did that? He was alive. I didn't tell him right off. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, your fa father, as I understand it, was a, a very close friend of Margaret J. Smith. Absolutely. Yes, and, and she was a lovely lady. I just went to the 40th anniversary of the Margaret J. Smith Library. Forty years ago, that library opened. She was fully retired, of course. And I think uh, Senator, then Senator George Mitchell and I were probably the only Democrats at that um, celebration, at that opening. So I remember that fondly. She was a lovely lady. I would stop in and visit her when I was working in Skowhegan and um, commuting from Farmington, have lunch with her from time to time, and discuss the politics of the day. Interesting. So every politician, and particularly governors, presidents, people that lead large groups of people, have a style of governing. Uh, Paul LePage had a style of governor. You have a style of, of mm -hmm. governing. Are you able, this is probably a tough question, are you able to describe your style of managing the office of governor of Maine? Well, uh, I don't know. It's partly that's up to the observations of others who work with me uh, day to day and, and legislators, but I will say what I try to do 
what I try to do is build bridges um, and bring people together. Uh, you'll remember about three years ago, we had a slew of workers' comp bills, and they were all sort of all over the place. And um, I thought, let's get people together and talk about what's going on in the workers' comp world. We got John Rohde, the um, executive director of the Workers' Comp Commission. Commission. I got some of the Republicans from the Labor Committee, some of the Democrats from the Labor Committee, and some stakeholders, as it were, some people who know something about workers' comp. And we sat at the table at the Blaine House, and I said, what is it you think you want to do? And let's explain what goes on now. Anyway, after several days of, of discussing, discussing and negotiating, we came up with a reform package that does a few specific things, and um, that both sides there was consensus at the end, so uh, I did that. I did that on some other labor bills. Um, I took a paid leave bill and brought it down from 15 pages to a page and a half so that it was um, succinct and meaningful in my view. And that was touted by many people as the most progressive paid leave bill in the country. And it applied only, you know, not to seasonal employees, not to part-time things, but to about 85 percent of the working people in Maine now have form of paid leave uh, because of a bill that I wrote one weekend. Um, in other areas, we've, um, in the budget, look at this spring, in April, we passed a budget. I signed into law a budget that was very much bipartisan. A unanimous committee report from the Appropriations Committee, both sides, uh, and a robust vote on both the Senate and the House side of things. And what we presented as the budget pretty much came out as the budget with some changes in the, in the committee. But let me tell you what that has in it. It has two years of tuition free to the community colleges for all recent high school grads. Two years free tuition. That's a first for Maine. That was a Republican and Democratic idea and independent. So it includes, yeah, that was a bipartisan. Absolutely bipartisan. It, it requires, um, it, it offers free, universal free food in the school system. Universal free food, so kids don't have to stand in one line or the other line or show their parents' income in order to get served a breakfast or, or a lunch at the school, system, at the school cafeteria. It provides an income tax exemption for up to $35,000 of, of your first, $35,000 of your retirement income. That was a Republican and, and Democratic. And 35000 is shielded from tax? That's correct. Uh, from the income tax. So we reduced income taxes. We reduced property taxes by um, enacting some property tax circuit breakers, homestead exemptions, and things of that sort. And we fully funded revenue sharing to the town so that we fund police work, firefighting, ambulance, and trash removal, and municipal services that people depend on, and thereby reduce the burden on the tax, property taxpayers. And we fully funded, for the first time in history, the state's share of public education, 55 percent state share of public education. In addition to that, this budget we just passed provides for inflation relief monies to the people of Maine. I think most of that's gone out the door now. Um, m about 850,000 people in Maine would have received, will have received checks in the mail, $850 apiece, $1,700 for two, two, fam two working family, person family. Uh, to help fight inflation, the least we could do, right? That was a bipartisan effort. I was going to say, is that in the budget? That's in the budget. So the budget has to pass w w with both parties supporting yeah. it, right? Two-thirds to become an emergency measure to yeah. take effect immediately. So you had to have a lot of Republican votes for that. We did, and some of the ideas came from Republicans, for sure. Republican ideas, Democratic ideas, and then they came and um, enacted a unanimous committee report and that's the budget that I signed into law. So as you travel, I'm, I'm interested in the $850 checks. Uh, your opponents criticize you for it. I think uh, your opponent called it a campaign stunt. Uh, and uh, what do you say about that? I mean, you travel around the state, you see people. Do they talk about the $850 checks, and do they regard it as a stunt? I've got a stack of cards and letters in my office from people all over this state thanking me for the checks that they received over this past summer, $850 checks, things that are pretty moving, frankly. A woman who said, you know, now I can pay my rent. 
uh, now I can fix my pickup truck. Now I can help my son with his college uh, exams and, and, and admissions. Now I can fix you know, things wrong with the house. Now I can put some oil in the tank and get ready for winter. Now I can gas up my car and pay for the groceries that I've been putting off or the prescription drugs I've been putting off buying. Those are meaningful things. It wasn't for me to tell people what to do with the money. Look, it's appropriate when you have a surplus as we and other states had. But in our case, to give back 60% of the surplus in the budget, give it back to the taxpayers. Why not? It's their money and it's theirs to do with, with what they shall. It's the most generous inflation relief package in the country. You know, you read about Charlie Baker in Massachusetts and the legislature there, they're fighting over whether to give $250 checks back to the taxpayers. We've done it here and it was 850 and people I think appreciate it. So when you campaign, uh, you go all over the state, you're campaigning everywhere. Sure. And even before the campaign as governor, you traveled all the corners of the state. Yes. So we have a, uh, you're talking about what you've done in four years and the bipartisan effort that's been made to get bills passed and mm -hmm. changes made. Um, when you go to places, I was up in Lincoln a couple of years ago and I saw nothing but Trump flags, Trump signs, Trump everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw some anti-Mills signs. What? As, I'm no. sorry. To I'm, I hope I'm not the first one to bring this news to you. It's, but I was shocked. But okay. <laughs> in any event, uh, but you talk to those people up there. Of course. And, so, and they're your constituents. Yeah. And so uh, when they get an $850 check, do they say, I, I'm not, they not thank you? Uh, I haven't talked to those specific people probably, but um, I've had a lot of people just come up to me on the street and say, thank you for the check. I really needed it. Uh, and it's the people's money. And I really believe that. I think um, my opponent was quoted as saying, she shouldn't give those checks to, to people. They'll only spend it. It's uh, theirs to only spend. Sp they'll only it spend it. And uh, they should be able to save it or spend it as they choose. So you read, back to something you said uh, earlier uh, about these bills, and you said you drafted a bill? Sure, yeah. I've drafted bills. And You've done that your whole life, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, well, the last couple, last 20 years, yeah. Drafting bills. Look, I mean, you and I know, I've argued more than 100 cases in front of the main Supreme Court. And oftentimes when you're arguing a case in the highest court of the state, you're talking about language in a bill. You know, if commas are misplaced or the word, what, what, the words in a bill make a great deal of difference in the significance and the meaning of the bill. Everybody comes to the legislature wanting to enact broad policies. And that's great. It's a laudable goal to enact a policy on health care, education, or climate change. And we all want to do that. But picking the right language and doing it the right way so that it has the effect that you want it to have is an important thing. I've always thought that, and uh, I worked for that when I was in the legislature for six years, too. So th th that's unusual for a governor, I think, at least in my experience, to uh, actually read, analyze the language, make changes, suggestions, and so forth. Well, uh, I, didn't, I didn't catch all the typos. Yeah, but <laughs> well, my mother was an English teacher. <laughs> so. but, but I think it's, you know, it, there are some politicians who are lawyers you spent a lifetime as a lawyer, mm -hmm. so I think that makes a difference, probably. I, I went to law school, not right out of school. I mean, I worked as a waitress, I worked as a secretary, a receptionist, a paralegal, did a lot of other things, too. Did real work I, first. I, of course I did real work. I, look, <laughs> I was waiting tables when I was 16 years old. Were you good at it? That's a matter of opinion. <laughs> so, um, Let's talk a, a little bit about uh, one of the uh, w one of the things that you did that was a great contrast with your predecessor. Um, states, as a result of uh, federal legislation, states were able to get significant grants from the federal government mm -hmm. for Medicaid and expansion uh, things, yes. of Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And in our case, main care, which we, mm -hmm. which is Medicaid. Medicaid. Uh, 
And we had a referendum in the state of Maine, did we not, on that we same did. issue? Yes, about six years ago. Yeah. Okay. And the people said they wanted it expanded and... Uh, overwhelmingly. Overwhelmingly? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it didn't get expanded because the, your predecessor was against it. So the fir I think the first thing you did was expand it. Yes. I mean, unfortunately, my predecessor didn't believe, apparently didn't believe that health care was a thing that we should provide and, or help provide for people. So after the citizens enacted by initiative, um, by referendum, Maine care expansion, when the federal government was offering to pay for it by to the tune of 90% of the cost, basically, um, the legislature then enacted implementing legislation. Five times that went to the governor's desk. Five times it was vetoed, which I think is very unfortunate. So one of the first things I did on day one in my administration was to issue an executive order enacting, enabling the, the will of the people and expanding main care. Now there are about 95,000 people on the main care expansion. And thank God we got to do that and before the pandemic. These are people pandemic. that didn't have health insurance Presumably before? Presumably did not have health insurance, health coverage before. And many of them, you know, they and their parents wrote letters of, of gratitude towards my staff and the legislature and to me. And, uh, I just, in retrospect, I'm so glad we got to do that before the pandemic hit the state of Maine as it did everywhere else. And pe those people had health coverage that they wouldn't have. Well, so what is the, uh, what was the argument of your predecessor against Medicare? Be, be, be you know, don't, don't do, just tell me what he said. I mean, what, uh, and then we'll talk about that. Um, what, I'm not so. I don't know his exact. I don't remember his exact words. He didn't issue detailed veto letters, but um, he did not think that health care was a right. I believe health care is a right. Did he say? Are you sure he said it's not a right? Words to that effect. But he also um, he didn't believe in taking money from the federal government. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, nearly two billion dollars, estimated two billion dollars. Uh, and federal funds were rejected by the previous administration for whatever, for a lot of, on a lot of things, forest legacy money, um, uh, cancer research monies, um, main care expansion, of course. A lot of monies were rejected by the previous governor because he didn't believe in taking federal money. And my belief is it is tax money, and if we don't accept it, if we don't apply for and use this money to, to benefit the people of Maine, it's only going to other states. It's going to other people in other states. So why shouldn't we access this? Why shouldn't we access funds to help the great research that's going on at the University of Maine, uh, at Orono, at Habib Daga, w offshore wind, cross-laminated timber? That, a lot of that was funded by EPA grants and whatnot. And um, why shouldn't we access funds that are rightly ours for research and development and health care and education? Title I funds for schools, et cetera. Of course, we want to do everything we can to expand opportunities for every family in Maine. So, uh, as I understand the opposition and what Republicans say about this, some, not all, uh, they're against government, basically. They say big government. Uh, they, they haven't reduced it, but they say they're against uh, big government and they're against government programs. And so, they call you Democrats the tax and spend Democrats and that you're spenders. And so I think the theory in rejecting all of this is we have to get off of this, uh, this habit of uh, taking money and spending it. Well, then apparently they don't believe in Medicare. Apparently they don't believe in Social Security, which is partly funded by contributions, of course. Apparently they don't believe in the Defense Department all of which are funded by the federal government. And I think that the federal government was a, was a significant partner during the pandemic, especially. Look, a bipartisan legislation promoted by S Senator Susan Collins, for instance, created the PPP, which became a, a loan to businesses to keep them afloat during the pandemic, and then a forgivable loan over time. Uh, we've, we've gotten American Rescue Plan funds, and we, were the, we are the only state, I think, to use some of those funds for healthcare workforce development. And we funded a lot of other programs, uh, forestry, farming, and fishing. Putting that federal money towards one-time significant expenditures to, 
to increase um, processing, you know, blueberry processing, um, fish and um, other agricultural processing. Uh, we're doing those things to be able to make the main economy more sustainable in the long run. So as governor, do you worry about government wasteful spending? Do you, work, do you concern yourself with, you know, how can we make sure that we don't overspend? And how do you do that? I expect every one of my departments and sub-departments to be accountable, accountable for what they do, what they produce, for the end result of their work. I've always expected that. And every state employee has an expectation, a goal, of doing their job and doing it well for the people of Maine, whether they're plowing snow in the winter or building fish hatcheries in rural Maine or whether they're um, doing hazmat um, investigations for DEP or DOT, uh, they, I expect them to do the best job they can, and I do trust state employees to do a good job. And in the budget process, I, I assume that the governor gets, all, gets proposals from cabinet members mm -hmm. and then reviews those proposals. Yes. And, and so you, do, you, do you accept them all? Oh, we have some very hard conversations. Ask any one of my cabinet members. And by the way, I'm just so proud of my cabinet. Fifteen really good people, nine of whom are women, highest percentage of women in, in the history of Maine, but fifteen really good people whom I trust and care for, care about. And I got a piece of advice from Angus, from Angus King when I first took office, and he said, among other things, he said, um, Hire people who are going to look at you and tell you what you need to know, not just what you want to know, basically. You know, because you, if you and I agree on everything, one of us might not be necessary. So I hired people, some of whom I never knew before. I didn't ask about their politics. I got their history, their experience, in that, their ex expertise in that particular area. Melanie Loison, for instance, the DEP commissioner, is extremely bright. And, and conscientious and objective. Um, Pat Kelleher, whom I kept on from the previous administration. He worked for LePage before? He worked for LePage. So did uh, Doug Farnham, Colonel Far Farnham. Um, What's he do? He's, a, he's the uh, uh, Veterans Administration, yeah. DVEM, um, head of the National Guard as well. And um, Ann Head, business regulation, I kept her on. She's been through several different uh, so there wasn't a wholesale change. Oh, you didn't no, fire no. everybody that no, he, no. he had hired. No, we didn't. No, three of them are. They stayed over, stayed on. And um, if you remember, my predecessor had, I think, eight different education commissioners in eight years. Well, my cabinet have stuck with me and stuck with the people of Maine through thick and thin. And one thing we told, we we decided early on in the pandemic, whatever happens, we're going to tell the people of Maine the truth, good, bad, or indifferent. And we told them the truth, and we had people like Nirav Shah out front there uh, telling everything in, in medical science and basing our recommendations and guidelines information on objective science, on medical fact. And we said, if the people hear the truth, they will listen and they will cooperate. And they did. And that is probably one reason why today we have one of the highest vaccination rates, COVID vaccination rates of any state in the country, and one of the lowest death rates from COVID of any state in the country, despite having a highest average age, it's coming down a little bit, but still highest average age. And we've been given awards, the Commonwealth Fund said, Hawaii and Maine had the best pandemic recovery of any states in the country. We dealt with it the best of any states. So Hawaii and Maine have the best COVID uh -huh. statistics yep. and program. Now that's interesting because actually that means we're the best because you can't drive to Hawaii, but everybody drives from Massachusetts and New York well, and brings their germs to Maine. <laughs> and Hawaii, you can't do that. Hawaii closed the airports. They closed yeah. right down. Yeah. Remember? They did. Yeah. So, uh, but you were criticized. Uh, I mean, you must have felt the pressure. You were criticized a lot for relatively strict uh, regulations during the height of COVID. Uh, did you feel the heat? 
Well, there were demonstrations outside the Blaine House on a regular basis, and people had a lot of anger. I understand that. It was a very difficult time. And uh, we tried our very best to save lives and livelihoods of Maine people. I will say that some of the Republican governors, who were friends of mine, um, uh, issued stricter mandates or guidelines than I did. Um, my friend Phil Scott in Vermont, he shut down manufacturing during the early days of COVID. Manufacturing and construction. I never did that. I mean, I wanted the economy to continue you, going. You were concerned about overdoing it. Of and, course, yeah. of course, but people's livelihoods depended on that. And so I also put together a group of about 40 people headed by Josh Broder and Lori Lachance to look at economic recovery from the pandemic. We have a 10-year economic plan that we issued um, before the pandemic, looking at three basic goals. But we took that plan, and I talked to the Federal Reserve Bank uh, of Boston, the head of that bank, uh, head of the Federal Reserve, and I said, how do I plan to, for the state to recover from this pandemic? First, he said, you can't have a healthy economy without healthy people. So keeping people healthy is first and foremost and that was our goal. We did that for the most part, and we kept in line with, you know, as opposed to many other states, and then put together the Economic Recovery Group, a group of really interesting people from diverse backgrounds who came up with the Economic Recovery Plan two years ago now. We then put that to the legislature, and when the federal government provided the funds through the American Rescue Plan, we had it all ready to go, unlike most every other state. Didn't have a plan. We have a plan. We had a plan. We, we're enacting it now. We've been giving uh, grants to child care workers and child care facilities. We've been providing tuition-free community college. We've been standing up ag agricultural and aquacultural processing plants. We've been um, paying stipends to child care workers. Uh, providing small business economic recovery grants so businesses can do what they have to do, whether it's buying new equipment or, um, or moving a location. One-time funds to give them a boost to stay, uh, stay in tune and, and, and um, be sustainable. So, Economic recovery plan, so that's the state's plan. It's in effect. It's funded... Uh, with help from the federal government, right? Sure, and like $50 million of that is for housing. Uh, and we worked with the legislature to parse out what what parts of federal money should go to what, um, what um, uh, measures, and housing was a big one. So we're working on that, too. Uh, yeah. ha ha housing is a huge problem yeah. in Maine and every other state. Yes, it is. We're not alone in that. But back to this economic recovery plan for a minute. Um, Child care, that's in the economic, I, I think this has always interested yeah. me because I've been around a long time and things evolve. And I don't think 50 years ago people thought child care was important to the economy. Mm. But today, people do. Can you explain that a little bit, why child care was so important to the sure. economy? Sure. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know that I married a widow. Well, you knew my husband, I know Stan. you brought up four girls. Five, five girls. Five girls. <laughs> you brought up five, five. girls. And, um, um, they were and you worked. Four, and we both worked full time. Oh, yes. Like my parents worked full time before me. But um, uh, I'll go back to the pandemic for a moment because that really heightened the need for child care and early childhood quality, affordable early childhood uh, education. And we saw a lot of women leaving the workforce during the pandemic, particularly women leaving w the workforce from uh, service jobs, different jobs in the service economy. And we heard from them uh, that they had to stay home, especially when the schools, some of the local schools went hybrid or went remote. They didn't have any options. So we looked at that and we started, began funding childcare in three different ways. One, to expand the phys physical plant so that there would be more slots available. In child care in centers? In child care and centers. Yeah, family child care or more, more commercial child care. Two, we uh, gave stipends to child care workers. Excuse me, commercial means businesses have their own... Right. Be, 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 some businesses have their own child care centers. Yeah, not in your own home, basically. Yeah. And uh, 
so then we gave stipends to child care workers, monthly stipends, to give them an incentive to stay on the job. And thirdly, we uh, provided more training at the community colleges and the CTEs. We funded uh, CTEs uh, and more training to, to educate at the university, too. University of Maine Farmington has an excellent early childhood education program. So we beefed that up so we get better training, more money for child care workers, and more slots. And that gets people back into the workforce. It's a work in progress. It's not finished yet by any means. But fathers and mothers, parents of all sorts, need child care to be able to work, even if they're working remotely for the most part, as many people, more people are now, they still need care. And the other, the other piece, the uh, free community college, explain that to me. Does that mean that beginning this year, this month, September, uh, kids that wanted to go to a Maine community college as a freshman, they were graduated from high school in May or June, go for nothing? Free tuition, that's correct. Free tuition. Free tuition. But can we sustain that? We're trying it out, and we'll check it out at the end of this budget. You know, budgets go for two years. So it's not a permanent expenditure, but we're trying it out. And, and towards the end of the two-year period, uh, we'll see how it's, go how it's uh, worked. Right now, we're hearing from parents and students um, and the administrators and teachers at the community college system that it's really catching on, catching on like wildfire. I got a letter from one woman who's she didn't think her daughter was going to be able to go to college. And then she found out, she called the community college campus in her area. She said, I heard a rumor that it, it might be free, free tuition. They said, it's not a rumor, it's true. And she broke down in tears knowing that her daughter was going to be able to go to college. It, so I assume that some other states where this is done or has been done. Do, um, do you know, are you aware of any? I'm not sure. Yeah. I didn't do that analysis. We just knew that we could do it here, and we wanted to do it. I, because it's my show, I, every time we have the show, I get to pontificate about something. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, I've never heard you do I, that. I, I, I want to pontificate uh, about what you're talking about okay. and this free college. I've, I've always thought that there were limits to what government can do. But the two central things that government can do that are central to everything is the common defense. Mm -hmm. Not the states, but the federal government. The common defense to defend us all. And, uh, and the other was to educate the populace. And so in the 19th century, we had, uh, you know, beginning with Abraham Lincoln, the idea of land-grant colleges and creating across the country, the federal government creating state universities, land-grant universities, to educate people for higher education, yeah. four years beyond yes. high school. Now, that was a hundred and some odd years ago. Okay. Uh, and uh, about 170 years ago, 65 years mm -hmm. ago, a lot's changed. And now, uh, a lot more people in this economy, in the technical economy, need to have a, another four years. They need to have 16 years, not 12 years. Not everybody, mm -hmm. not everybody yeah. needs it. But if you're not going to be in a skilled trade, if you're not going to be skilled in some technical area, if you're not going to be a plumber or electrician or whatever, it's important to have that. And, but we've always resisted having the government get involved in it. I mean, look at uh, uh, Joe Biden got severely criticized for, uh, you know, writing off some of, the, some of the debt. But the fact of the matter is, it's the one most important thing besides mm -hmm. common defense we can do is to have a highly educated populace. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's resistance. And do you sense the resistance against this, uh, this t t two free years in community college? I've heard so much, uh, so many positive things about it that, no, I haven't heard resistance. And it was a bipartisan effort, bipartisan... You had Republicans move. that worked oh, with yeah. you on this? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, no, and, and the legislature thought it was a great idea, too. So uh, I think it's been very positive. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. I think, you know, 
and we're expanding the, the scope of the curriculum. We know we need healthcare workers, so we're training up phlebotomists, surgical assistants, nurses, uh, pharmaceutical technicians, all, all, all a dozen or so types of healthcare workers. We're training up uh, early childhood educators. We're training welders and plumbers and pipe fitters and um, electricians and automobile repair people and mechanics and we're training people to install solar panels and we're training people to install heat pumps. Right now we're at, I think we've installed 80,000 heat pumps well towards our goal of installing 100,000 by 2024. So these are new trades as well as traditional trades and even the traditional trades need different equipment which is why we funded capital expenditures in the, in the CTEs this year to upgrade their equipment. So is there any provision to, you know, after you go through the first year, to have an assessment? How did it work? What did we do wrong? Because things will go wrong, and things are always capable of being improved. What do you do? Do you just continue the program, or do you look at it and analyze it and change it? No, I mean, we want to be accountable for every program we start, every program we continue. And uh, education is, is along the same lines. We want to see what the results are, and let's see if certain curricula, certain courses weren't as popular as we thought they might be. And that's the job of Dave Daigler at the community colleges and Chancellor Malloy uh, at the university system and the, and the board of trustees, too, to see what's working, what's not working. Let me go to another uh, subject, climate change, and I'll just pontificate for 10 seconds here. I'm one of these people that <coughs> me. think, because I'm old, looks at this and says, this is the most serious problem confronting the world, the planet, and it's serious. And we've debated for a long time whether it's serious or it's a hoax. It's serious. Mm -hmm. How do you look at climate change in terms of the, the, its importance to people who are responsible for governing? We know what the United Nations uh, scientists said, that uh, it's code red for humanity. I believe that. Every um, reputable scientist in the world has said climate change is real. Danger is imminent. We're seeing huge forest fires in the West. We're seeing weather events that we've never seen before. Record number of vicious, uh, violent hurricanes in the South storms and rising seas. You ask the fishermen in, in the Gulf of Maine, is the ocean warming? Yes, it is. Is the Atlantic uh, Ocean uh, rising? Yes, it is. And the Gulf of Maine is, ri is, is warming more than, or at a faster rate than 99% of the world's body, uh, uh, water bodies. That's a scary thing. It is affecting our fisheries. It's affecting our forests, it's affecting our agriculture, it's affecting the ticks that are coming north. And we all get warnings about going out into the fields and woods and not wearing long pants because the ticks are out there now, things like that. It's affecting so much and it's going to affect a lot more if we don't take significant steps to arrest it. And in Maine, we have set a goal of uh, becoming carbon neutral by 2045, and we are on our way to achieving that goal. What I did when I took office the first year in office, I established a climate council. That climate council issued a plan, an action, climate action plan, and we're moving towards every one of those goals right now. We lost eight years on climate action. Honestly, we did. My predecessor signed a moratorium on wind power, didn't believe in wind power, onshore, offshore. My predecessor signed up, a, you know, signed onto a coalition of Gulf states that want to drill for oil off the coast of Maine. That's not my idea, and I withdrew from that coalition. Instead, we engaged with the people across Maine and said, "How can we help weatherize our very old housing stock in Maine? How can we wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, which is our main source of residential heating uh, source?" The four or five billion dollars a year that goes out of state to pay your heating bill, to pay your oil bill to companies that are far away from here. We need to get ourselves off of that. So we're working on that. We're not taking anything away from anybody else. We're providing options and alternatives 
safer and more climate issued, issue, climate related um, options. Look, the net energy billing uh, for solar power. Uh, there's solar power, solar farms of various sizes all across the state. We're putting solar panels on schools and landfills and and all with the ultimate goal of weaning ourselves off of dangerous fossil fuels that commit that uh, emit carbon and sometimes methane. You know, some of the people watching this program are probably like me and don't hear these terms a lot, but don't know where they fit into uh, diminishing the threat of, of climate change. Uh, carbon neutral, what's that mean? You know, um, the, the uptake of carbon dioxide in the air is what's causing, well, ultimately causing the ice, icebergs and parts of Greenland and, I, and Iceland to, to melt, and then that causes the rising seas and warming seas ultimately too. Decrease in the pH of oceans is caused by uh, ocean acidification, is caused by all of this uptake of CO2. So when we emit CO2, we're causing dangerous uh, uh, effects in the atmosphere of our Earth that result in melting ice and other, um, other actions, other things. So um, the danger is real. The danger of the atmosphere causing the horrible forest fires we're seeing out west and the horrible storms we've seen down south and elsewhere. Tornadoes across Kentucky just a few months ago and warming oceans, rising seas. So we're also trying to help preserve our sense of place here in Maine, preserve our communities, putting our assets towards community resilience. Whether you live on the ocean or on a, a lake or in the middle of a forest, being aware and being prepared for the effects of climate change is important for individuals and for whole communities. So that's why we are uh, going out into the community and talking about building up that um, uh, the riprap along your ocean pier and increasing the, uh, the level of your, your, your dock, things like that. Are you sort. doing that? Is the state uh -huh. doing, urging people to do that? We are. I'm going to tell you a story. I live on the ocean. Uh -huh. And uh, I've lived in my house for 42 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm losing the front yard to a rising ocean. It occurs in storms in the winter. Yeah. The storms in the winter never ate away at the front lawn. And they have the last few years, and I'm losing things. And I called a guy. I have a guy over there began today. Talk about riprap, mm -hmm. putting riprap down. And I said to him, I came, I visited my son in Chappaquiddick uh, at uh, Martha's Vineyard, and I, they have these bluffs. A lot of houses are on bluffs. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you see riprap and a lot of stuff. Yeah construction going on to try to save these Fortify. places from the rising ocean. And the guy that's doing mine does it in Maine. He said, I cannot keep up. Mm -hmm. I cannot keep up. So so what is the secret? More, more renewable energy, less fossil fuel? Absolutely, that's a priority. And, you know, the, the CO2 is emitted from burning fossil fuels, as you know. And so if we burn fewer fossil fuels, then we don't emit as much carbon dioxide into the air, causing this extensive damage and harm to the atmosphere and ultimately the, the earth, so uh, the environment. Um, so weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels is important. Whether it's exercising the option to uh, buy an electric vehicle and Efficiency Main Trust is issuing rebates and, and, and uh, um, incentives to buy or lease electric vehicles. Keep your pickup truck, keep your car, but have the option of uh, buying an electric vehicle. Um, we also have incentives and more robust um, rebates for um, heat pumps, oh, which heat are pumps. really heat and cooling, heat and cooling yep, pumps. Yeah, I have those. Yeah, and then generation of electricity through renewables as opposed to through fossil fuels is huge too. I think we're not going to have to worry the people that uh, uh, that worry about big government are not going to have to worry too much about the government uh, forcing them to an electric car. I, I think the manufacturers are going to do that for us. They see the handwriting on the wall, and mm. pretty soon, no matter what your state says, no matter what your governor says, 
you're not going to be able to have a car, a gasoline engine car. In time, the manufacturers are just going to make electric vehicles, and we're all going to have to, we'll all have one if we want a car. Well, I think the demand is, come, is, is rising. Uh, it hasn't caught on as quickly as uh, it has in other states. In Maine, I think it's about 6,000 or something that have been sold in the last year. But um, again, people like their pickup truck, and I want them to have their pickup truck. I like pickup trucks, and I like cars. Well, you're a country girl to begin with. Well, I need a pickup truck. You're a Franklin County girl. <laughs> Got to move stuff. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, the demand for electric vehicles will be increasing, is increasing, for a variety of reasons. Efficiency and cost. Look at the cost of gasoline up and then down. I mean, gosh, you know, you can't you can't depend on it being stable. So, so what about? Uh, drug prices. I'm sensitive to that because I'm old, so I take a lot of pres prescription drugs to keep me alive. And um, everybody says oh, they're too expensive. And then I know that there's a lot of pushback in Congress. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to get red and blue, you know, uh, Yankees mm -hmm. and Red Sox here, but for some reason, and I've never understood it, the Republicans in Congress are opposed to controls on pharmaceuticals, on drug mm -hmm. prices. I, and I'll never understand it. Maybe I'll have somebody on the program and ask them about that. But <coughs> did you have a, did you have a, a, an effort to, to do something here in Maine to control drug prices? We passed a couple bills. There were, like, there were four bills coming out of the state Senate a year and a half ago. Uh, regarding prescription drug prices. But more importantly, just recently, the federal government did do something. Congress actually acted in the, what's called the Inflation Reduction Act, also called Climate Change Act, also called Prescription Negotiating uh, Bill, whatever you call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. negotiating Medicare. for Medicare and Thank prescriptions, God. right. And, and they could always and... do that, but they was always stopped. The Republicans did not want yeah. the pharmacies the pharmaceutical companies to have to deal with the government it's on these prices. It's a heavy lobby there. It's a heavy lobby, the pharmaceutical co companies. Yeah. But, uh, but Congress passed that. That's being phased in so that the federal government, on our behalf, uh, will be able to negotiate on, Medi on ph pharmaceutical prices, prescription drug prices for Medicare recipients. We used to have people going from here, from Maine, on buses Canada. To, to Canada. I think people are still doing that very quietly, sometimes going across the border. Now that the borders reopen um, to get their prescriptions filled. A lot cheaper in Canada? Absolutely. Isn't that amazing? Just a few it's miles. Sad. It is sad. It yeah. is It is indeed uh, uh, sad. And I think the federal government, I think the Congress also capped insulin prices over time, actual yes. flat, sort of a flat fee for insulin, monthly fee. And uh, Susan Collins has uh, sponsored a bill in Congress, I think it's it's stuck right now to a federal bill to control insulin prices. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so I think that's still pending, but we don't know where it's, whether it's going to go anywhere. So, all right. So you got uh, uh, you've, you 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 you've got this desire to spend four more years leading our state. Well, I do. Uh, yeah. Well, I do. <laughs> I think. It's, it's, look, it's a good job. Well, it doesn't pay that great, but I'm not <laughs> complaining. The lowest paid governor in the country, but regardless of that, it's been really challenging these last few years. And the main people have been through an awful lot. We've been through an awful lot together. And I want to get us back on track. We're getting back on track. I want to continue the progress that we started over the last four years, fully funding education, addressing climate change, health care issues, and keeping our economy back on track, broadening it, addressing our workforce issues and housing issues, which we're doing now, we're addressing them, and uh, making Maine a better place. Look, I have grandkids like you do. My five grandchildren are all in Maine. My two little girls, the three-year-old and six-year-old, I love them to pieces. And when I sit and talk with them, they're talking about you know, will that tooth grow back in sometime soon, or have I lost it for good? Uh, what am I going to wear to kindergarten? Or uh, am I learning to tie my shoes right? You know? And I think, when I sit and listen to them, will they have the same opportunities I've had? 
what opportunities, what will the world look like for them 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now when Lord knows I'll be gone. I want to make sure they have a, a better world and the best world and best opportunities they can have. I want to help provide that for my grandchildren, for your grandchildren, for the families across Maine who work so hard to make a better life here. I want us to be a welcoming, safe state for everybody with opportunity for all. And don't you think there are Republicans that you deal with, that you know well, right. in the legislature that share the, that desire of yours? I'm sure there are. Yeah. Uh, the, the criticism of you, I've, try, I've tried in preparation for this, I, I tried to figure out what they're criticizing, what, what your opponents are criticizing you for. You probably know better than me. You're probably aware of the Let's criticism. See. I can't think of one. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't think of any valid well, I criticism. Being, I was being accused of causing gas prices to increase, but now yeah. they've come down, so I should take credit. Uh, I've probably been accused of creating the baby formula, uh, empty shelves of baby formula. I don't know. Who knows? But, but they're kind of national, worldwide issues yeah. that you're accused for. Is, am I correct? I mean, they, the economy, they say the economy, well, you can only do so much. I mean, if you're one in 50 states mm -hmm. and in a country that's one of 220 countries in the world. Uh, Inflation is a worldwide issue. It's a worldwide issue. But no matter what you do in Maine, you're not going to affect worldwide inflation, right? And that's why we chose to, to issue those checks this summer. It's the least we could do, if not maybe one of the very few things we could do at the state level give people money back to put in their pockets, to save, or to pay for the groceries, the prices that are increased, put gas in their car, oil in their tank, their f f furnace, do what they can to, uh, to get by. You talk to a lot of people in this state. I mean, you're everywhere in the state. Mm -hmm. You go in a restaurant, somebody wants to come and tell you what their problems are, and they write you letters and sure. so forth. Uh, just back to the guest, to many people say, what are you going to do about the high gas prices? Well, the price of gas is coming down, so not so much Yeah, anymore. I know. You just took credit <laughs> for it. We've done a yeah. great job, and, and you, 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 you've done a great job and work to make sure that the Russians don't drive the price up. You, you, your foreign policy is excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, well, thank you. Uh, but uh, the people, I'm just curious. Does somebody say, what are you going to do about the gas prices? I'm sick and tired of you know, $4 sure. a gallon. Yeah, and, and um, there was some talk by some people in the legislature about suspending the gas tax, state portion of the gas tax is a federal tax and a state tax. And we, when we did the analysis, they kind of backed off because, first of all, it would take all that money out of the highway budget. And second of all, it wouldn't put money back in people's pockets to, to any significant way, to any significant degree. They might save you know, like 100 something dollars over a year. Um, so it didn't seem to be worthwhile. And instead, we put money back in people's pockets, yeah. $850. I, I don't think he can do anything. It's a, it's a worldwide market. Mm -hmm. I could call Putin and you tell, could call ask Putin him to get and say, out of Ukraine. Stop this war. Yeah. You see what it's done to gas prices here? And, yeah, and he will... Yeah. He wouldn't take my call. He won't take your call. Take yours, so so. you gotta, you, you got to forget that. So... Um, Elections coming up in November. In the next two months, is it mostly on the road a lot? Oh, sure. A lot of on the road. Uh, I mean, I'm a full-time governor, uh, as well as on top of campaigning and um, running the office and um, but, so, listening to people, going out and hearing from people on the road. How, how valuable is that? What, listening to people, does that... Tell me, make the connection for me. Does that help sure. you govern? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I heard of, um, I was at an AGC meeting recently, and then I heard from a legislator about a proposal to um, require sprinklers in every single family home. And I thought, mm, I don't think we're ready for that. So I'm addressing that with the powers that be. I think be. that's too invasive. I think so. So uh, we're following up, uh, following up on now, that. Now, what do you do? So you had a couple of legislators that want to put... Uh, pass a law to put uh, require everybody to put sprinkler in their 
yeah. house. What do you do? You talk to the legislature. Sure. Say, Look, I'm not, not sure oh, about oh, this. Oh, sure. We do. We do all the time. And I, what I want to do better in the coming years is to get in at the ground level with legislators, especially new legislators, because every two years, a third of the legislature are brand new to the process. So. Uh, now that we're sort of off Zoom, we're doing in-person, they'll be doing in-person hearings and legislative sessions, uh, get to know them better at the, at the very first stages and talk with them about their ideas and see if we can work with them. Um, if an idea seems like a good one, hasn't been debated you know, many, many times before and rejected, then we work with them and get things done for the people. How do you make. get to know them? Uh, have them over for breakfast. Um, during the pandemic, I had Zoom breakfasts, breakfasts with a variety of legislators, always always bipartisan, some Senate, some House members, and just who are so you? you have, and, and so now you're in, more in person. Yeah. You have Republican legislators over to the Blaine House? Of course. And, for meals yeah. and stuff? Yeah. And they like it? Uh, they seem to. The food's good. They show up. Yeah. Well, if you remember, I think when Joe Brennan was governor, um, when uh, Joe Sewell and Linwood Palmer, if they got into a, a stalemate over the budget, he'd bring them over to the Blaine House and shoot a little pool. There was a lot of that. That's how they did You still have a pool table they, in the Blaine House? There is house? a pool table and it still has some scars, but yeah. <laughs> you do, huh? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, we got about a minute left here. Okay. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you. My it's pleasure. interesting to get some insights on the issues that you confront and how you're going to deal with them and if you're reelected the next four years and what you intend to uh, uh, accomplish. I hope that you'll speak with your fellow governors. And maybe you already have a governor's group on climate change. Yes, we do. You do? Yeah. Are you in it? Yes. Good. Get them going. All right. We, we are. We will. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It was always good to see you again. Thank you for coming, Governor. We appreciate it.